Back in the 70s, there was a, a saying that was going around on bumper stickers and people were quoting it to each other, and it was that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Now, we had that at the, at the parts department. We were in an auto dealership, and we had that on the back wall there, you know, because every once in a while, uh, Chrysler would make a car that was a lemon. And so when people would come in and complain about it, we would point to the sign and say, make lemonade, you know, make the best of a bad situation. Uh, actually, that's where the lemon law for Wyoming came from is because car dealerships did sell cars that were continually breaking down. And, and so you, you did make lemonade by getting a new car. Uh, but we also say things in the church like, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window. Now, you know, I've really, never really understood that because a door and a window are two different things. You know, some of the windows that, that, that we, I would uh, look at it, were pretty small, and I wouldn't want to go crawling through those. Uh, but we'd say those kinds of things that make ourselves feel better, you know, that, that this is the way that it's supposed to be. And, and so, you know, when God opens, a, 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 closes the door, you start looking for something else. You start looking for a window. In, in the will of God, uh, there are different aspects of the will of God. Uh, and, and God is always at work. And, and a Christian always lives within the will of God. And you say, well, now, wait a minute, that can't be true. Uh, what about when we sin? Can that be in the will of God? Yes, it is in the will of God. It is the sovereign will of God because God created us with a will so that we can make choices. That doesn't mean that we'll always make right choices, but he gave it to us so that we can make choices. So it is within God's will when we sin. But now, here's the active will of God. He created the, the worlds and everything that we know in six days. That's God's active will. He just, bam, and it happened. And then there's the reactive will of God, manifest in Israel's life all throughout their history, that every time they sinned and fell away from God, God reacted to their decision-making and gave them a consequence of their choices. And then they would repent of that and come back into a relationship. God also has a passive or permissive will, mostly manifested in the person of Job of the Old Testament, where God allows things to happen. So we're within the will of God if we are Christians. But what I want to talk to you today about is the active will of God, that God makes things happen. Now, I, I've talked to people throughout the years uh, on this point of theology, and they say, you know, it really doesn't make any difference where you go or what you do. You can always serve God. So you don't need to pray about decision-making. You don't need to pray about places that you are. You want to move to Buffalo? Just go ahead and move to Buffalo, because you can serve God there just like you can Shan. And yet, I, I think that it goes beyond that, and I think the Scriptures teach that God has an active will in our life, and He has an active will for each and every one of us, that God does care about where we are and what we're doing, and God is going to manifest His will in our lives. We start in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, with verses that are very familiar to you, I'm sure. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I think that's pretty pointed, don't you think? God telling us what He wants from us in our life. I don't think anybody's going to argue with the fact that we need to be a, a rejoicing people. I don't think anybody's going to argue with the fact that we need to be a praying people. I don't think anybody's going to argue the fact that we need to be a thankful people. But I don't think that knowledge is our problem. Well, two weeks ago we talked about this. because Just because we know it doesn't mean that we do it. And God expects obedience to His will. And so... When we are outside the will of God, God's got to do something to get our attention. And probably no better given to us than in the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, beginning with the third verse. This is talking about Saul and how Saul was persecuting the churches and how he, he, he sought to bring harm to those people who said they were Christians. And it says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, there are a number of folks who say that you don't have to do anything in order to be saved. Well, I don't think that the Scripture bears that out either. 
And he asked, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. In other words, there's something to do with our lives and, and us doing what God wants. Verse 7, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when, he, when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He was blinded. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now, I was going to church one Sunday morning, and Cody, we, we lived uh, right next door to the church, so it was an easy walk. And, and on the way there, my neighbor was working with a mule. And he reached down, and he got a big old stick, and he just smacked that old mule upside the head. Well, I thought, man, that's not right. That's, that's animal abuse. So that afternoon, I went over and talked to him, and I said, you know, I, I said, I, I saw you with your mule this morning, and, and that looked like animal abuse to me. And he says, have you ever worked with mules? I said, well, no, I have never worked with mules. And he says, well, before you can teach them anything, you've first got to get their attention. And he says, and their, their skulls are so thick that you can't hurt them by hitting them. You've got to smack them upside the head. Well, since that time, I've, I've, I've figured myself to be mule-headed. Uh, b because I've got to be smacked upside the head in order to get my attention so that God can teach me anything. You see, Saul was, was one of those guys who had a good and noble heart, but he was just severely misdirected. He didn't know God. He knew about God, and God wanted him, and so God was going to get his attention. So, in other words, Saul is being prepared. You know, the plow to the field. He is being prepared so that God can work in his life. And so when we, when we look at this, all, all we can see is that things are not always the way that they appear. Because we could look at Saul and we could say, you know, that was, Saul's being punished by having this happen in his life. Uh, he's, it, God took away his sight. But clearly what we see with Saul is that God took away his sight so that he could give him sight. But in our lives, oftentimes what we find ourselves doing is steering away from God's will. What we know God would want from us, for us, maybe through us. We steer away from that, and God wants to get our attention. And so when we look at something and we say it's a bad thing, we need to understand that maybe there's a divine reason there. Got to share with you a bit of a story. Uh, I went to Walmart again yesterday on a Saturday. Uh, you, you know, and I know you're questioning my intelligence, um, but I, I got this figured out, you see. You, you slip in, you get your stuff, and you go up to the self-checkout counter, and, and you go through there really quickly, and you zip your credit card, and man, you're just right out of there. Well, yesterday I did that, and everything was just smoking, and I thought, well, this is really going to be a quick trip to Walmart on a Saturday. I did all my uh, things through the, the register, ran my card through there, and it declined my credit card. So there's a line of people behind me, you know, and, and so I check it out, and I zip it again. It declines my credit card again. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm thinking there's something wrong with Walmart stuff. So I use another credit card, and, and I get out of there. Go to Lowe's. Guess what? At Lowe's, he runs the card through, and he says, it's declined. I said, there must be something wrong with the machine. He says, zip. Nope, it, the card is declined. So I went home and I called them and I said, you know, my card just got declined twice. And they said, yes, we're aware of that. There's a hold on your account. I said, what, why is that? And he said, did you buy an airplane ticket in Kentucky this morning at three o'clock? I said, well, no, I didn't. Uh, he said, we didn't figure you did because your last charge was in, in Cheyenne and your next charge, tried charge was in Cheyenne. So we put a hold on your account. Somebody has gotten your information and is using your credit card. He said, but it's okay, We're, we, it's not went through your account yet, we'll close your account down, send you a new card. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, as you're standing in line, and you're thinking, what are all these people thinking about this loser up there who's using this card, and there's no money on his card, and what was apparently a bad thing at the time was really a good thing, because they found that somebody was fraudulently using my credit card. Now, that's how life happens to be in the Lord. What God is doing in our life may make no sense at the time, but God is using it to bring us to focus upon Him, to see Him more clearly, so that something that may need correcting in our life can be corrected so that we can have God's blessing. Well, let's go on in the 
book of Acts there, in verse 10. Uh, now there was a certain disciple of Damascus called Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Uh, well, so far, we're right there with Ananias. That's what we would do too. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting uh, the, his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered the Lord, this is the part that we, we, uh, you and I can relate to. Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now, Saul has been prepared and Ananias is being prepared. And he says to Ananias, this is what I want you to do. And Ananias says, are you sure? Are, are you kidding me? Because, you know, have you forgotten who you're sending me to? This man has authority given to him by the chief priest, and, and he's not done good things for the church, and this is what you want me to do? You know, Larry shared with us from the book of Exodus during his sermons this last week. I want to do the same. In the book of Exodus, the third chapter, beginning with verse 7, it says, And the Lord said... I have surely seen the oppression of my people, he's talking to Moses, who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, you know, this is the human reaction inside of us, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, the, you, you, you need to be aware of the relationship between Moses and Pharaoh. That 40 years ago, when Pharaoh uh, at last saw Moses, he wanted to kill him. Why? Well, because Moses had violated the law and killed an Egyptian soldier. So Pharaoh was seeking to kill him. And so God is saying, I want you to go back and talk to Pharaoh. <laughs> you know, and Moses is saying, oh, uh, me? Uh, who am I? You know, I tried that once. I, I, I tried working with the Israelite people. They didn't like me much. They, they got me in trouble. And, and, and so, you know, you, you, must, you must be mistaken here. Uh, so what we see is Ananias saying, you, you know, are, are you sure you want me to go and talk to this guy who's got great authority? Uh, Moses said, are you sure? And he, you know, it's not me. You got the wrong guy. You know, the bush is burning. He's talking to him. You got the wrong guy. It, it, it must not be me. So what we see is that the Israelites were prepared by God to leave Egypt, and God is preparing Moses to go lead his people out of Egypt. What we see with Saul is that Saul is being prepared and Ananias is being prepared to bring the two of them together at a point in history to where life is going to change for both of them. God's will was at work in everybody's life. God has given to them what his will is and what he wants from them. And their response is very much like ours. Uh, are you sure it, it's, it's me? Larry was talking to us out of this passage about the hindrances in our life that would stop us from doing God's will. What hinders us from doing God's will? Well, it's not knowledge. We pretty well know what God's will is. It's not knowledge. It's, as we talked two weeks ago, about a belief that we don't or do have in that knowledge. You see, and that's what's being questioned here. Moses is saying, you really, you want me? 
Ananias is saying, really, you want me? Here's a question. Do you think God wants to work in your life? You know, and, and just as, as we would look at these guys and we'd say, yeah, uh, they were going up against impossible odds. Uh, there were things that, that they looked at and said, you know, I can't conquer these giants. Do we have giants in our life? Yeah, maybe the next door neighbor. Maybe somebody we work with. We look at those people and we say, you know, I, I really should say th- something to them about the Lord. Maybe it's somebody in the church. I really should say something to them about the Lord, that prompting that comes from God that is His will. And, 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 and yet we say, you know, who am I? Preacher ought to do that. One of the elders ought to do that. Who am I? I'm not even a Sunday school teacher. Who am I? The question is, truly, who are you in the Lord? And does God have a will for you in your life? Back to the book of Acts again, the ninth chapter, um, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, he was talking to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever thought about evangelizing somebody by saying, Come, let me tell you about the Lord and how you're going to suffer after you give your life to him. Now, that's a good sales pitch, don't you think? And yet, that's what Ananias went to tell Saul. Not how much love and joy and peace he was going to have, not how he was going to have his sins forgiven and how he was going to heaven, but how much he was going to have to suffer for the sake of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. So God tells him this, and then this is Ananias' response. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the key to this is, and Ananias went. God explained to him what he wanted him to do and why he wanted to do it, and he didn't question it. He got up and he went the way that he was instructed to, entered the house, did what he was told to do. Now let's go back to Moses for just a moment in the, uh, the 13th verse of uh, the third chapter. Uh, then Moses said to the Lord, <clears throat> indeed, and he's already said, who am I? God, so God told him who he was. Uh, then, then Moses said to, to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, God is often referred to in the Old Testament as the great I am. We even sing songs about the great I am. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, and it should be capitalized in your Bible, I am has sent me to you. And then he goes through the rest of the chapter uh, telling Moses about what he wants him to do, how he's going to do it, and who God is in relationship to the people. And you know what Moses did in the first verse of the next chapter? He says, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, I, I, I got another excuse here as to why I can't do this. You know, An- Ananias said, are you sure, Lord? And God said, yes, and he went. Moses comes up with another list of excuses as to why he can't do it. Who am I? And we look at Moses, and there's two ways to deal with God's will in our life, God's active will in our life. We're either going to be the Ananias who says, okay, you want me to? I'm gone. Or we're going to be the Moses that says, I don't talk very well. You know, uh, I, I, don't do, I don't do things really well, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure that this is what you, you got. Are you sure this is what you want me to do? Uh, by the way, the, the end of the story of Moses, if, if you've not studied this part of it, the end of the story is Moses ends up going anyway. You know, he just wasted his breath and all this time making excuses for why he couldn't do the will of God, and he ends up going anyway. God finally gets tired of him and says, go, and he went. Um, and God's active will is going to be that way in our life as well. The problem is that when God has something that he wants from us, for us, and he's got something he wants to do through us, and we're saying, 
No, I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I, you know, here, here's the best one. I don't know that person well enough to get involved in their life. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure Moses really knew Israel after 40 years. I'm not sure Ananias knew Saul. What in the world difference does it make whether we know the person well enough or not to get involved in their life? Well, that's excuse number 87, and we're going to move on to excuse 88. But all the time that we're using excuses in our life of why we can't do God's will, God's blessing is withdrawn from us because the reactive will of God is going to give us the consequence of our disobedience. See, God gives us His will. It's manifest here. His Holy Spirit's at work in our life, manifesting it in our spirit. God's will is that we, we know what God's will is. Why don't we do God's will? Well, we can say because we have a belief problem, but reality is at the bottom of the line, the end of the day, what we've got is an obedience problem because we're not being obedient. We have two ways to go with God's will. It, we can be an Ananias. We can question once and then move on. Or we can be like Moses and just offer excuse after excuse after excuse. But we're going to end up doing it anyway. Well, what's the point of everything that I've been talking about? You know, they say that the art of preaching is to be able to say in 20 minutes what the normal person couldn't do. Well, let me put it in the two-minute version here. There are people in this room this morning who God has given somebody in your heart that you need to talk to about Jesus. And there are people here this morning who have not followed the prompting and the leading of God in their life. The decision is whether to be obedient and receive God's blessing, be disobedient, receive the consequences of our disobedience, and the unpleasure that's going to go along with that when in the end, we're going to end up doing it anyway. God's active will. Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you for the examples that you give to us in Scripture that teach us about you and who you are and who you want us to be and what you want from us. I, I thank you, Lord, that you have given to us from the Old Testament into the New Testament countless examples of how you had a personal will for each and every one of your children. And I'm thanking you now, Lord, that you, you have manifested, that you care about the little things in life, that we do play a part, that we are significant, and, and that you do have something for us. Uh, if you know the number of hairs that are on our head, then certainly you care about the little things. And even though we may look at ourselves and like Moses say, who am I? Lord, I'm just praying that your spirit remove the hindrances that stop us from doing your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.